Honestly, this just looks so bad to letting get in all the Pokemon Go know it. Story. As they a fire red, red. How am I supposed well, to next grind year, if I then. can't battle wild this Pokemon? Like and Zulet not forget the here, the graphics look like, look like I S think Y to call it. This game so far just gets a overall really bad a rating flaw. for this now. To me just Congratulations, looks like a cash Nintendo. These graphics are worse than any Switch game I've ever seen. People are so fucking stupid, I swear! Anyways, hello viewers, I am the Weapon of Choice, the Omniblade here, here to talk about the title of this video, and that is, why are so many people tired of Kanto, or why are so many people suffering from Kanto fatigue? As we all know, these complaints started popping up around Generation 6 with Pokemon X and Y, where Pokemon finally made the shift from the classic 2D sprite-based art style that many of us grew up with over to the 3D models which I'm sure many of you watching may have started off with yourselves. But, Nintendo was worried that people wouldn't be happy with this transition, so they used a lot of nostalgia targeted towards mostly Generation 1 fans, which came in two forms, and that was the free Kanto starter you got in addition to your Kalos starter, and the Mega Evolutions given to said starters that many other Pokemon, but most notably the Kanto starters got, since you just got it for free without any real effort. Now we know that the Gen 1 pandering is nothing new to Pokemon, but what if I were to say that it was a series staple? That's right people, I am brazen enough to say that every single main series Pokemon generation relies on aspects from the original red, blue, and yellow that started it all. And I do mean literally in its, well, literal sense. So sit back viewers and allow me to make my case as to how Kanto hard carries every other Pokemon generation on its back to varying degrees. Generation 2 is the easiest case to make, as after you complete your journey in Johto, you realize that, oh yeah, you just explored one half of the landmass you live on, and that the other half was Kanto this whole time. This was all possible thanks to the skills of the late Satoru Iwata, who managed to compress the data to the point where there was just enough room for two massive regions to fit on a single Game Boy cartridge. Since Gold and Silver was the first and remains to date the only Pokemon games to pull off such a feat, which remains one of the best post games we've seen in a Pokemon game to this day, all of which cultivates in a final boss battle that has gone down as one of the best super bosses in gaming history. Now we move from the easiest case to make to the hardest case as the Hoenn region is completely devoid of Kantoitis and remains the most unique region because of the conscious split between the amounts of land and water. However, this is Generation 3 I'm talking about, so this is the gen where instead of trying to add in parts of Gen 1 into the current game, Game Freak just said fuck it and remade Gen 1 entirely using the Generation 3 engine. Fire Red and Leaf Green were then released onto the world as an attempt to recapture some of the original audience as Pokemon was undergoing a noticeable decline in popularity at the time. This was the first time Pokemon heavily relied on nostalgia, and after seeing these games barely sell a fifth of what the original did, Game Freak knew that they had to shake things up as they transitioned to the Nintendo DS. Generation 4 marked a turning point for the series, as this would be the start of Pokemon games that used dual screens, but also marked the physical special split, causing competitive Pokemon to flourish and become a staple of the series from here on out. While there were many new Pokemon added to the Sinnoh decks, there were also many Pokemon which were evolutions or baby versions of existing Pokemon, and a great deal came from where else but Kanto. Funnily enough, most of the additional evolutions in this game that came from Generation 1 were rather forgettable as they didn't add anything new or interesting to their previous iterations, but were just slower, beefier versions of them, and it was actually more of the Generation 3 evolutions that were used in competitive play and more fondly remembered in the long run. Generation 5 is the one I'm looking the least forward to talking about since I'm sure everyone will call me mad as I say this. It's been universally accepted that Generation 5 marked a soft reboot of the series, as this region consisted entirely of all new Pokemon, and no previous Pokemon existed here, except until after the post game where you could find them all in the other half of the region. So, how does this borrow aspects of Kanto? How doesn't it borrow aspects of Kanto? I like to call Generation 5 Generation 1.5 because it is trying, my Arceus, it is trying so hard 
to be a better version of Kanto, and for many people it succeeded, and is a beloved installment by many, including this guy. However, for me personally, oh, no, just, just, no. This game not only tries to outdo Kanto in a not at all subtle way, but it tries to do so by just ripping off Kanto and giving us obvious knockoffs like an annoyingly fast stage 2 flying type Pokemon that lives in caves, a 3 stage rock type Pokemon that has sturdy for its ability and only reaches its final evolution through trade, a 2 stage mono poison type that's literal garbage. The list just goes on and on and on, which is a damn shame because when there are unique and original designs in this game, they are some of the best Pokemon in the Unova decks, and Black 2 White 2 are some of the best games we have and are what I expected Black and White to be when they first came out. The original Gen 5 games desperately tried to recapture the new adult Gen 1 audience, but failed in doing so and lost some of the fans it recovered during Generation 4 as a result. I've already talked about Generation 6, so I won't dwell on this for too long, but with the Kanto starters being given for free once you reach Lumio City, their Mega Stones being easily obtained, and the fact that out of the 28 Mega Evolutions added into X and Y, 12 of them were from Kanto, and the only two Pokemon that received dual Mega Evolutions were Charizard and Mewtwo, the most iconic Pokemon from Kanto, it's clear as day what Game Freak was trying to do with Mega Evolution. Gen 7 is where Game Freak stopped trying to be subtle, so fuck it, I'm gonna do the same. Alolan forms were added in as these unique versions of existing Pokemon that were completely different from their Kanto forms, because only Gen 1 Pokemon got Alolan forms, but there were only 10 evolutionary lines that got them, and they're just the exact same Pokemon with either identical stat lines or just slightly min-max stats, given new or if they got especially lazy, just a secondary type, a new ability, and that's it. But they managed to take it one step further, and as I'm just gonna spoil the champion of Sun and Moon here, this is the most egregious example of Gen 1 pandering done by Game Freak, because Gen 1ers wouldn't even understand having the champion of Sun and Moon be Professor Kukui as a direct reference to the unused super boss battle with Professor Oak, which I have 10 bucks on will be in these new games, because Gen 1ers stopped caring about Pokemon in Generation 1, meaning they don't know the reference, Game Freak. Ugh, now that I've listed all the ways in which Pokemon has tried to recapture this now 20, 30 something year old audience, I'm getting sick of Kanto. As we can all see, the Gen 1 catering has gotten especially bad with recent installments, but I want to bring up some statistical data I found when making this video, because if you take all the main series, exclude remakes, you get this graph that shows the total sales of each dual entry and third or third and fourth versions in some instances of each generation at the time of making this video, excluding any virtual console sales on the 3DS. Pokemon versions red, blue, green, and yellow sold nearly 60 million copies worldwide, with Pokemon's Gold, Silver, and Crystal selling over 42 million units worldwide, then Pokemon's Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald sold 36.6 million units, Generations 4 and 5 sold around 25 million units each, with Generation 5 selling about a million fewer copies, Pokemon X and Y sold only 16 million units, which is due in part to the lack of a third and fourth installment, and Pokemon Sun, Ultra Sun, Moon, and Ultra Moon sold over 31 million units worldwide. The next chart shows the sales of initial versions of each generation, and the pattern is fairly consistent as Gen 1 sold over 31 million copies with the initial two games alone, with Gold and Silver and Sun and Moon selling just over 23 million units, and every other gen hovers around the 15 to 18 million unit mark with their initial releases. So what causes this change? Why are Sun and Moon the best selling launch games for a generation outside of Red and Blue? My guess is because of how they were marketed. Sun and Moon were treated as this fresh new take on the standard Pokemon formula, which was just untrue as we saw with the trials being neutered gym challenges and the islands not offering any unique features that wouldn't be in a regular region. Now, in the games literally right after Generation 7, we are getting a much larger shakeup. With Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu, we are seeing a wholly unique experience with brand new capture mechanics, new overworld features, 
and who knows how many other changes. This game is not the Generation 8 that many people were hoping for, and is clearly an attempt to integrate Pokemon Go players into the main series console games, which I have my thoughts on. Pokemon has now managed to catch lightning in a bottle twice with the original Pokemon games release and the phenomenon that Pokemon Go caused, it only makes logical business sense to make Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu. While this is not the type of game that is targeted towards people like me that enjoy the more traditional JRPG aspects of Pokemon, but clearly towards a much more casual audience, I think this is a good thing. There is nothing wrong with expanding a fanbase to attract more people, as this is something Nintendo has done with its other big franchises in recent years, and if this game isn't your thing, you can just pass on it after we get more information on it. Why I'm glad this game exists is because it gives Game Freak a buffer period. They now have more time to polish Generation 8 as, as let's be honest people, Pokemon doesn't handle transitions well. We saw it with the abysmal speeds at which Diamond and Pearl ran, the frame rate issues that were in X and Y, and sadly went unaddressed in Sun and Moon. I hope that these games will lead to the true Pokemon experience we've all been waiting for, as Pokemon finally makes its way onto a console, which about half the install base uses as a handheld anyways, and that number will surely increase with these games, and maybe, just maybe, we will finally get a truly fresh take on Pokemon. This has been the Omniblade, and just like many of you watching, I look forward to seeing how these games unfold. Till then, hope y'all have a great day, and I'm outta here. Peace.